I remember near the end of grade 12, trying to figure out what it is I was going to do with my life after school. And I came to school and I was just like, Jay, I got something to tell you. He's like, me too, man. I just got to say something. And right at the same time, we were both just like, we got to make movies for the rest of our lives. Getting to make your own feature film is such a privilege and it's amazing. We're doing things that people dream about. If I could just keep doing what I'm doing and make films with my friends, and if I could figure out a way to do that for a living, that would be a dream come true. at a, a gear rental house doing checking movie lights and all this garbage and I'm, I'm surfing the internet you know wasting time and I see this ad on Ain't It Cool News which says Grindhouse is coming out and they want two minute trailers like old exploitation style trailers and I was like man this is perfect. Well, as soon as we had it on the internet um, like instant crazy exposure like it just blew up. As soon as I saw that on YouTube, I, I knew it was going to take the prize. And then we heard that uh, Alliance wanted to take our trailer and put it at the front of every single Grindhouse print playing in Canada. That was probably one of the biggest moments. It was like, you know, you win a contest and that's amazing in its own right. But then someone's just like, listen, I believe in you so much. I'm going to put what you did and play it in theaters everywhere. That might not even be legal. Like, that's just amazing. I, I've never heard of anything like that happening to, uh, you know, what is essentially a, a piece of uh, internet fandom. That's a big deal, especially for us. We made this crazy little short film for, you know, 150 bucks and a couple packs of smokes for Dave. And uh, we're being flown to Toronto to meet one of Canada's biggest and most prolific producers. You know, they walked in and I just like saw, you know, these three hosers, you know, I <laughs> just said, oh my God. But once I saw that they're good guys and that they're really set to make this film no matter what. And they're humble and they're, but they're, you know, they had their own confidence. We just kind of hit it off. We had a great time. Uh, we went back to his place after dinner and we drank some scotch. Jason just completely destroyed this, you know, ultra rare, like, you know, you never irreplaceable scotch. And we just had so much fun together and I think he just thought that, you know, these guys are fun to hang out with. I imagine it'd be fun to make a movie with them. He insisted that our visions be true and that what we wanted to do be made possible. You can't ask for more than that from, from a producer, and especially one of his caliber. All he wanted to do was help us make the film that we wanted to make. After we shot the trailer, we introduced Dave Brunt to the world, who gave this amazing performance as the hobo. And I think a lot of people thought that he was some actor that we found in Nova Scotia. Uh, but uh, the truth is he had never acted a day in his life. What you see on the screen is basically Dave's real frustration and uh, the world, I think, kind of fell in love with them. When we put it up on YouTube, because all the other trailers were going up on YouTube and they were just blowing up and ours started going crazy and you know, people started recognizing who he was and wanting to know who he is and talking about him on the internet. You know, he never, he has no computer. He's never used the, used the internet before that. And well, I feel famous because, you know, so many people have seen the trailer, you know, not just in North America, but I guess in some parts of the world. Jay just fell in love with Dave and um, wanted him to be in a movie so bad. So when it was Hobo with a Shotgun, Jay was just like, this is a Dave Brunt movie. The bear speech is pretty much word for word from Dave's mouth, you know, edited a little, because he has like a, a 10 minute speech about bears he will give you. 
If you ever talk to Dave Brown about bears, he will go off. You can survive in bear country if you, if you use your brain. But the moment you make a fucking mistake out there, I can't guarantee your life or your safety. That's it. You're screwed. Because remember, they're wild animals. A grizzly can tear right through this fence. This wire mesh. They can tear through that like nothing. They want to. So remember, in bear country, use your head. Use your common sense. There you go. It was like this caged bear like unleashed onto the screen. And uh, our thought was that we would always shoot the feature film with Dave. So we planned, like it was like a year of planning where we thought, you know, we would use Dave, we would try to get Dave some acting lessons, and uh, we would shoot the feature with him. There was one point where he just went missing. He went missing for like a couple months and I couldn't find him. I was going to his house at like four in the morning. I was calling his parents, trying to get a hold of his family to see if I could find him. And I, eventually I found him. I found him on the set of another film. <laughs> I could tell that like when I found him that there was a sense that he was kind of trying to hide away from me. He was trying to avoid the project. You know, you know, I have my days where my physical condition interferes a lot. And, but I try to ignore it and get on with the acting at the same time. But, you know, like if I was another 25 years younger, I'd, I'd do it all the time, you know. And so we had a long talk and we sat down and I said, Dave, you know, like, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And he's just like, Jay, I don't, I don't think I can. I don't think I have it in me. And so I said, you know, well, let's, you know, you and me, let's try and find someone who could do it, like who could do you justice in this film. We went through a bunch of names together. We watched a bunch of clips of actors. And uh, when Rucker Howard decided to do the role, Dave's face lit up. He was so happy. I think he's, I think he's a lot like me in a way. He was like. He was like a brother I never had, you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> it was great. It was a message from my agent. There, there, you know, there are a young bunch of people who are making this movie and uh, I would like you to be in it and they have no money and a Rutger, it's not my kind of movie. Okay, so I read the script and um, I thought, what the hell is this? What the hell is this? He made a video on his computer and put it on YouTube today, and it's just him talking about coming to Halifax, like why he decided to do the movie. Meeting Jason. Yeah, he talks about like me and him talking for the first time, and and uh, he just like tells us a little story about it, and he talks about like you know his his agent thinking that he shouldn't do this movie, and that you know. Really? His, he talks yeah. about the script. He's like. What to think of it? <laughs> it's pretty weird. <laughs> it's pretty weird. So I thought, well, let's see what the director, you know, says. And I have like an hour conversation with Rucker Hauer, which uh, was very nerve-wracking because uh, he was someone I always looked up to growing up. We had the conversation, and uh, I let him go and kind of walked away from it, not knowing what to think. I was like, oh, maybe I was an idiot. Yeah, Jason asked me the same question. Why would you, why did you decide to do this movie? And basically said, Jason, I, you know, I can be wrong, but I work by instinct most of the time, and that's where my decisions are made. They're not based on like one, two, three, five, seven. I just thought, I gotta do it. I just gotta do it. And then when I got there, the first day, I already saw that I, that I was right. Monday morning, first day of shooting for Hobo with a shotgun. Grady! Uh, Let's do this, buddy. Um, it was snowing last night. I think it's, uh, I think the snow stopped. 
It's cold as hell. We ran out of heat in my house, and I'm frozen to the core, but ready to do this. <laughs> A couple weeks ago, I wrote this on my door and says, Be honest, because with every decision I make, I try to be honest with it. Be exploitation, because we're making an exploitation movie. Be hard, because this movie's got to be hard as fuck. Be confident, which is one of the most important things a filmmaker can be. And have fun, because if we're not having fun, then why the hell are we making movies? The first scene you shoot in any movie usually sort of sets the tone for what the rest of that experience is, is going to be like. And the first scene I shot uh, on this film was uh, uh, burning a school bus full of children. Now what's going to happen, I'm just going to tell you because I'm sure it's on your mind. Uh, what happens is the guy comes on and he burns the bus. <sighs> because he's being really mean and it's a kind of a mean movie and that's what he's going to do. We are really going to burn a bus. I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for this scene. The burning school bus scene was always there, and it's the one scene that has been kind of the thorn at our side for this whole process, and it's always been questioned. And that was the first scene that was shot the first day, as it turns out, so it was in the can before anyone could even say anything, and there you go. They actually gave me a flamethrower that shot a flame 20 feet out into the air, and I was like, all right, cool. I hate homos! It's freaking nuts. Like, it, you're giving a flamethrower to an actor. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome, you know, burning the bus. And I just saw the, the roof of the bus kind of just contort. It just started melting and it just changed shape. And then it went from like, oh, this is warm, this is warm, to hot, then you're like, oh, too hot? Oh my God, I'm gonna die. This is so freaking hot. Run off the bus, oh shit, my hair's on fire. And we looked at his hair and it was all charred. All right, so I was sitting at my desk at the office and Jason Eisner comes along and he's just like, hi, Kat. So I'm like, hi, how are you? He's like, good, good. Um, Rob's got something he wants to ask you. So he takes me into his bigger office and I come in and there's people working at the table and Rob's in the corner. He's like, here he is. So Rob looks at Jason, he's like, I have to ask her. So everybody puts their heads down and I'm like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? And he's like, sit down. And he sits me down. And I sit there and Rob's just like, we need a child prostitute in our movie. Did you see that scene with the pimp? Quit fucking around with that homework and he takes her homework away and makes her go work the streets. Fucking bitch, stop wasting your time doing homework and get up on the block and make me some money. Come on, baby. So, Daddy, you ain't mad at me. Give me a kiss. She's the opposite of a prostitute, I would think. Whatever that might be. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Is this, this is magical chemistry that ended up coming out of our cast, and everyone was so great. Greg Smith, who plays one of Drake's sons, him and Nick Bateman, who are just so fantastically evil in, in two very different ways. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Ivan, you're gonna ruin the fucking skates. I ruin everything. <laughs> Let's fuck. My ultimate goal is, you know, just to be happy all the time and by being happy it's me doing what I'm passionate about and acting right now and stunt work is definitely what I'm passionate about. I had so much fun on this film and it just showed me what I want to do and what I want to do is this. He's always laughing, he's always paying attention to what's going on. Um, you know, this was his first movie. I run the fucking show! I'm gonna show everybody they're gonna fear the fuck out of me! In fact, they're gonna make comic books! out of my hate crimes. Ivan is the guy who can be the ultimate release for insanity and hobo with a shotgun. He can say 
anything. Go the fuck home, everybody, and don't forget to wash your dicks. <laughs> it was like 10 minutes before the shot, and Jay was just like, I think we need a crazy line, like a really, really, really good line, like the best line of the movie. <laughs> so he looked at me and was like, all right, man, I'll get on it. I went up to Nick and I was talking to him. I was like, Nick, what do you think? Like, what, what, do you, what do you think we should do here? He looks down at the skates, he's just like, Woo! It's a beautiful day for a skate rink! <laughs> Everyone on set died laughing. The next day, actually, we went to another set and the art department, somebody was so stoked that they had spray painted it as graffiti on the wall. Hopefully hockey players can endorse this saying, you know, it's time for a skate rape every time they go onto the ice. Something that we kind of discovered on set was that Slick hates everything. This cocksucker gave me the shittiest Christmas presents. I hate Christmas. <laughs> Greg Smith, the man, is nothing like uh, Slick, the character that he plays in this movie. And one of the scenes that really punches that home for me because it's just so sleazy and greasy is when they attack the apartment scene where he comes in. Do you fucking see me? Do you fucking hear me? Do you fucking feel me? He's perfect for Slick. And uh, did he ever prove that to us in spades? You know how I can tell I'm making you wet? No. Because you're making my dick thirsty. I just had a flashback of uh, Brian Downey, who's um, the Drake. Family entertainment. I provide you with nothing but the highest quality and adrenaline filled family entertainment. We got this audition tape. Uh, from Brian Downey. Immediately we both, when I, I called Jay right away when I saw I said, did you watch this? And he was like, oh yeah, it was amazing. And I'm like, we have to, we have to get Brian to be the trade. Action! Time to get the show on the road, boyo! <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Drake Show. I don't think people thought that the Abby character would be as strong as Molly ended up making it. Because of Molly, because of how amazing she is, <laughs> the movie really just became about Abby. It's amazing. Like When I saw that I was number two on the cast list, it really kind of hit me. I was like, holy shit, this is my, this is my big thing. This is huge. Like, yeah. <laughs> Guess what? They've got the biggest home of any of us. It's called the streets. And right now, we're all standing in their home. So maybe we should show them some goddamn respect. <laughs> I'm kind of a shy person, and I'm walking down the street feeling self-conscious, I just, no, I'm fucking Abby. Let him go, Drake, or I'll talk your boy to pieces. Abby. I mean it. I'll melt this fucker to the ground. It's dirty, and it's scruffy, and it's naughty, and it's, uh, and it's soft here and there. And that's all because, you know, Molly brought that softness to it. You grow it, we cut it. We'll get out of this town, we'll go somewhere where they have nice big lawns to mow. This isn't the only place grass grows. Are you serious? Yeah. First I gotta wash this guy's ass all of my face. He's perfect. Uh, he comes from our world. 
He's an amazing actor. Everyone loves him. You know, Rucker Hauer. I mean, how could you not want to have him in your movie? Maybe. I know, bite me. A hobo with a shotgun. physical duress that he's been in and under for this movie. There's a scene where I carve, I carve scum into his chest and I'm on top of him with a switchblade and you know, he's, you know, no offense record, but he's a little bit older, but just a tough, tough motherfucker. But there was a scene where uh, a couple cops take the hobo and they throw him over this balcony and it's like a 20 foot drop into this ditch. And so we had a stunt performer do it into all these garbage bags. And then I wanted to get a close-up of Rucker landing in the bags, and I just thought, you know, I'll just get him up like two feet, and he'll just jump into the frame. And I and I started setting up for the shot, and I looked behind me, and he's setting up a ladder, and he gets up on top of it, and he's just like, roll the camera, and I was like, what's going on here? He's just like, you tell the EPK guy, the behind-the-scenes guy, that there's a 66-year-old man doing a stunt right now, and he does a front flip off the ladder into the garbage bags, no joke. One of the biggest fears I had on Hobo with a Shotgun uh, as a producer was showing Rucker Hauer the manhole that he was going to have to spend uh, a few days in overshooting the uh, climax of the film. We really didn't have a plan B, so I wasn't sure what we were going to do if he'd said no. I went to his trailer and I knocked on the door and I uh, invited him to uh, come with me so I could show him. He was just like, yeah, no problem, just uh, have a seat in there for me and it'll be good. It just shows how, you know, much Rucker was there to be a part of the movie and just, he just basically went beyond the Call of Duty and did everything that we uh, hoped he would and, uh, you know, it was a huge relief. You want to you put your shotgun into his spokes. <laughs> what you grow up with as an artist leaks into your work and The Plague are definitely a pretty big example of growing up in the 80s. He's the designer for the Plague outfit. Oh, turn around. It's black, it's green. This is like what I've wanted since I was like 15. It's it. And the Plague are everything that's cool. Plague are these endearing characters that I just, you know, I love and I think everyone's going to really groove on and shooting out in their, in their lair out in this old Martello Tower with the uh, fire effect that was going on, these tentacled creature and motorcycles, I mean how can you not like motorcycles with basically these dark knights driving them around and metal gear. Making those costumes out of what he made them out of and making them wearable for the actors, unbelievable. He's, he's the best. I've been hammering it inside. This is the, the secret, this is a steel salad bowl. I uh, was at a party and saw it on my friend's shelf and uh, said that I had to take it and he was, uh, I kind of didn't want to let it go because uh, he makes his dog food in it. But I, I managed to, uh, to get it out of him. When it came time to shoot this film, he didn't have uh, the amount of credits needed to be in the union to sh uh, so that he could actually work on the film. 
And I basically just said, if, uh, if Jason Johnson can't work on this movie, then I'm not going to make this movie. And so they really fought really hard to get him in the film, and it worked out. And he was able to work uh, full time on the film, building costumes for us. And uh, he designed and built the plague for me. Uh, he put his heart and soul into it. And um, I just love him. Like, I will work with him on everything. Now she must take his place in the plague. Here we go, and action! I'm sure we're gonna get some coming up this week. I'm fucking hat! Fucking junkies! Stop it! We made a really shitty looking hospital, and I hate hospitals, and just being in here right now kind of just makes me feel sick in my stomach, and we're just about to do uh, the scene where Abby gets her neck stitched up, and the doctors are giving her needles, and just even thinking about the needles is hurting my arm right now, so I'm, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to look at the monitor, I can watch, uh, Guys getting their stomachs exploded, necks getting slit, heads being blown off, but when it comes to needles, I hate it. I wonder who taught Gary how to tie his shoes. <laughs> Let's put this on the DPR. Jason Eisner just about lost his lunch during that one. The last two days, three days before we went to camera, there were at least like memos going out saying, don't bring your expensive rain gear to set because it's gonna get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get bloody as fuck and just like, <laughs> and just like, let's just put it to the floor and get nuts. One of the things we like is blood. This is the first time I've sprayed like five gallons of blood a take. This is the most blood heavy movie I've ever worked on, that is for sure. My name's Henry Townsend and I love blood more than anyone you've ever met. He loves to put his hands in it, he loves to get his face in it, he loves to roll around in it. He loves blood. Oh man, it feels great. Fuck. I know it right, because it just feels right. The character Logan's head gets ripped off by a noose tied to a truck. The idea is that we wanted a sprinkler of blood gushing out of the manhole cover. And uh, one of the Drake's girls comes over and she does the dance. She does the dance in blood. And that being my kind of particular interest, I uh, went with a 10 millimeter lens up close and dirty to her. She was basically going all crazy, doing this crazy dance, like <laughs> It was nuts, man. What we set up here was what we ended up calling the clubhouse, and we all worked in this room together. So when anyone came in with a question or an idea or a problem, we'd all be here to hear it. It helped foster and create this, you know, you know, we're a team. Everyone is encouraged to fully cooperate and be collaborative. You see me sometimes stressed out and I, I'm in another world most of the time, but I truly appreciate everything you guys are doing. We're very lucky, like we had like such a hard, hard working crew here. The people who will just go the distance to make your shots as amazing as they possibly can and they'll break their backs and they'll lose sleep over it. This crew is you know, 
amazing because they're, you know, the half of them work for nothing and for the experience. And the fact that they are supporting uh, Jason in shooting movie. That's all pretty strong stuff. And we cut ourselves open, shook hands, and sure enough, we're blood brothers. This is the scar here. I got it on my thumb right there. <laughs> <laughs> you probably can't see it. What the fuck were you thinking? Nothing really, it just seemed <laughs> right to do. Just Everyone should have a blood brother. <clears throat> you got a blood brother? The last time somebody gave a kid from Dartmouth three million dollars there were drugs involved. And so it's pretty crazy and I feel very privileged to have received such a large amount of money to make a film. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing and when I think about it, it's, I'm very grateful. There's not too many kids in Canada who get this opportunity. And so I thought, you know, making a feature film, oh, we're gonna have some money. Like, we're gonna be able to do some things. And uh, I learned very quickly how fast uh, the money can get drawn out and how little money you have to put on the screen. Me, Rob, and John and Eve basically had to give our paychecks back to the film in order to make it work. I got this emergency call from Beth Anna. It was like, Jason Shoes literally just fell off his feet. Can you bring him his other pair? So I went to get his other pair and they were just not fit for anything. So I had a spare pair of uh, Slick and Ivan sneakers, just like the Converse high top, so I brought them up to set. They're yours forever. Oh, wow. And if you find them too awesome. flat, we have instruments here for you. Location oh, just informed me that people have been asking when people are on set, they're like, is that the Kobo? It's like, no, that's the director. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that this is a low-budget movie, it's like, it, it should feel like we just you know, tried our hardest to get this movie made and it should have some of the drawbacks of a low budget movie just to, I don't know, make it fit into that realm. It's crazy, we got probably four more minutes to get another take of this and then we got a wrap. Um, right now we got George Trombolopagus here and he's getting really fucking bloody for us. Um, what's happening right now is that the yeah, Ivan character comes in with a hockey skate, slams it into his chest, and we're trying to get the blood to spray. We've been having a little bit of difficulties with it, but we got one more try, and I think we're going to nail it. So, we've got nine minutes, guys. Ten, 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 ten. I just want to get another one. <laughs> and some scissors. I have Things were moving so fast on set that everyone had to come together as a team and take on different roles and responsibilities and we all had to help each other out. And this was from the top to the bottom, like, you know, there was no level of, you know, I can't do this because this is my job. Everyone did everything. And I'm the sound mixer, the slick stunt double, slick photo double, gang member number two with the witch mask, and my car was a picture vehicle on Hobo with a shotgun. Every morning they would say, holy shit, like how are we going to get through the shot list? <laughs> and it was always a fight, it was always like, Jay, this is too many shots, this is too many shots. All I'm saying is we got to get the scene, so we, like... Alright, well, let's just figure it out. We've figure already, already can... left so much for tomorrow. I don't even know how we're going to do tomorrow. We bust our ass and we would get through it. Like, we usually met uh, all my all my shots. So, I think we did about a thousand setups on this film. And from what I hear, most features shot on this, uh, on this budget usually get around like 500 setups. We ended up shooting a 65 to 1 ratio, which means off of the projected running time of the film, 85 to 90 minutes, we shot 65 times that amount of footage so far on the movie, which is a surrealistically large amount of 
image to be collected on a motion picture. Pretty much all 99% of these movies were rendering homage to with Hobo the Shotgun were shot on film. The way we did it on the schedule, we did it with um, the kinds of lights we used, which was a, actually a pretty minimal lighting package. Would never have been possible, uh, ironically, to do on film with this kind of visual quality that we ended up with. So Hobo with the Shotgun is a homage to the old while using the best of the new. These cameras, I hate them and I love them. I love them because they're so flexible. At the same time, it does not give you other time. It does not give you a break. Hey, hey, hey. It's like fucking martial arts. You know, it drives me nuts. And especially, you know, if you're, if you're carrying a film, you know, it's hard to get your energy because it just keeps, it burns, you know, it keeps burning. That's, that's sort of the shadow of it, because you can do it fast, but sometimes it means, that doesn't mean you have to do it fast, okay? So you have to force yourself to take some time and feel it better. And we don't always get there. That's part of the animal. This is exploitation. This is how you make an exploitation. You shoot your night scenes in the fucking daylight. And then you call it night. All right, ready? Who gives a shit? <laughs> Let's do it. Here we go. Roll out, true. please. All right, now let's now the people go away. All right, guys. So the trucks are done. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So uh, are we done? Like we max out time? Oh, we're maxed. Okay. That's a wrap, everybody. The hardest day was probably the last day of principal photography where we had so much to do in so little time. We were shooting a very complicated scene, uh, an action sequence in a small space. Um, so things, you know, were slow and stressful. Went into overtime, which is something that we didn't do very much during the movie. We're just a little over. We can't carry anything on for tomorrow, so there's a lot of tension on set. People are worried they're not going to get their shots. And on top of that, they're tired. And you're tired, and you got all that stuff on top of it. Tempers get really short, people start to freak out a bit. We've always been on time, but for today, I fear that the complications of this might bite us. I want to fucking kill you. <laughs> let's go, let's get Roger in here. I'm ready, I'm ready, let's go. Action. Cut. Cut that. Cut. You get it? Cut. All right, thank you. Yes? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. <laughs> oh, yeah. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? I'm just a little bummed out right now because that was like one of my favorite scenes in the script. And I had to cut out one of my favorite moments of it. <sighs> I guess, you know, just gotta get used to losing your babies. Sometimes you can't get everything you want. Just not enough time. And it just got really, really stressful at the end there. And we only had a half an hour to do like five or six shots. And it was just complete mayhem. At least I got mojo. Got mojo. It's okay, bud. I know, bud. <laughs> You'll always have me. I know. I came home and I was so excited and I thought, you know what, I think I'm meant to do this. Like, I, I feel like I'm really meant to be a director and, and make films for a living. And it just felt right. And um, so I think, yeah, I think it totally felt the way I always envisioned it. And I'm just so lucky I got to do it here in my hometown with all my friends. When people think of Canadians, we're like really wholesome, nice people who are so polite. And, you know, it's the Americans that are supposed to be all uh, bloody and gory, but like, I guess no one knows about Dartmouth yet. And they're about to find out. Hobo with a Shotgun is definitely a Nova Scotia film, primarily a Dartmouth film. 
And if you've ever been to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, or if you are from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, you will understand. But with a shotgun isn't that different from everyday life in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. This kind of stuff just happens there. So, um, it's sort of like a documentary on Dartmouth, only with a little bit more colored lighting. I thought this was uh, going to be a peaceful little Canadian town. But Dartmouth is a pretty shady little place. Back in the day, we were just shooting movies with our friends, and someone was gonna fall on the ground or fall fall over the side of a, like an embankment or something. You just do it. We just do it. We didn't care about safety or put down mats. We were just we would just throw ourselves off anything. Um, and so that was kind of a, that was like one of the big differences for me shooting a feature film was some of those little things where things would take so much time. Uh, to prepare, whereas back in the day, if something needed, if someone just needed to get lit on fire, you'd just throw the gas over you and you'd light it and go. And action! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Someone's gonna die. <laughs> Well, the last two days have basically been the time for us to get together, our friends, and uh, shoot movies the way that we normally shoot movies, which is without a lot of tools at our disposal, and without a lot of people, and the whole machinery of mainstream filmmaking. And we just, you know, basically go out guerrilla style and uh, shoot things whacked, crazy, and by ourselves with our, with our buds. Jason's now sitting on the back of a pickup truck as it's speeding away chasing a couple hobos and undoubtedly he'll probably fall off the back of it before this is done. I got Kareem back here holding on to me for dear life. I'm hanging out of the back of the truck. We don't give a shit. We're just going to fucking roll on some crazy garbage and we'll see what happens. I guess my worry with the future is basically that uh, because we, for our first film, we made such a crazy, risky film that people might get afraid of us and might be afraid to give us the reins of another feature film. But who knows, maybe the film will do good and maybe it'll capture an audience and people will get excited about it. I'm hoping there are future feature film projects, um, but who knows, you know. Um, if this was my last one, my first and last, I think we made a pretty good go for it. I'll still make short films. I'll still make feature films, just with 120 bucks again. Now, the moment you've been waiting for in your full mind. <laughs> the world premiere of Hobo with a shot. What's up, Lana again? Live you whore? Live you fucking whore! Live you fucking whore! That's a record. We love them! You're like, yeah, play, awesome! That's what you did to my mom. That kind of thing. How the fuck does this even work? First 
time I found a porno stash. Yes. This is my terrible dream. Is that some kid will see this movie way too young, love the line so much that they go to school the next day and start quoting crazy shit from the movie. And when they're heard by their teacher, they will get suspended. And I hope that that happens and someday I meet one of those kids and they can tell me that they got suspended for quoting Hobo with a Shotgun at school. And I can tell them that I always hoped that would happen. That's my dream. Ha <laughs> ha